<laughs> I really hope my voice doesn't sound too tired for this. Grab your piece of paper. Let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is Hughes on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. I wanted to do a special edition today because we're so close to getting to 3,000 subscribers. We're now at 2,706 subscribers. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Tell a friend to tell a friend that we are doing lectures on the channel and today we're going to be looking at a very very important aspect of internal medicine pretty much how to answer internal medicine questions i often get a lot of requests and how do you work through the diagnostic process how do you know that this is the diagnosis how do you know that this is the right answer to a particular question so here is a step-by-step -step guide that i've actually put together to help you now have the the correct thought process of how to actually answer internal medicine questions. So I really hope you enjoy this. And here's our example question. A 27-year-old nurse at Kabwe General Hospital presented to the emergency room. She complained of a headache the previous night associated with fever around midnight. She developed vomiting and started feeling cold. Physical examination revealed altered mental status with Glasgow Coma Scale of 8 out of 15, a stiff neck and a rash on her legs and abdomen. Her BP was 85 over 45 millimeters of mercury. Pulse was weak, about 115 beats per minute. A lumbar puncture was done, had high pressure and grams stain showed a negative gram negative intracellular diplococcus for 20 marks a what is your diagnosis write in full five marks b what is the causative organism two marks c list the most severe complication of this infection three marks d what is your management plan for contacts to this patient four marks what is the management plan for members of the community where she resides three marks what is the treatment of choice for this patient, three marks. So I want you to have this question in mind. And before I actually dive into the process of how to think through these questions, the first thing that I would actually advise you that some mistakes that some students tend to make is they do not read through the entire question. So always make sure you read through the entire question before you start attempting to answer any part of the question. If you do, just read one question and answer as you go. It's kind of like a situation where it's a wash and wear. You wash something and wear it. It's still wet. It's going to become very quickly soiled. So make sure you read through the entire question and you have an idea what the examiner is wanting of you because sometimes questions tend to build upon each other. You find out that, for example, A, you give a non-infectious diagnosis and you get to B and they ask you for a causative organism and you're confused. That means that you now start to rethink the entire question and you're thrown off and you have wasted time in the exam. So make sure you read through the entire question, understand what is being asked of you. Gauge the marks that are allocated to the question. If it's five marks, that means that you have to have some thinking attached to that or your diagnosis must be a bit longer than you expect. If you have five marks and it's just one word, unless if it's a special word, but otherwise you would have left out maybe some elements of the diagnosis. If it's two marks, there's no need for you to overthink it so much necessarily. Whatever you may be thinking may possibly be correct. So here's a five planned step-by-step -step guide of how I actually think through my questions and formulate my diagnosis. This actually does even work when you're dealing with patients on the wards, when you're dealing with patients in real life. So your step one is to identify the signs and symptoms in the question. So through your history and your physical examination, getting a good history, getting your physical examination findings, the significant things that are there. Step two is to link your signs and symptoms to clinical diseases. So pretty much linking your physical features, linking your history to clinical diseases. Step three is using your investigations to uh, rule out the clinical diseases. So here, this is where you're going to be creating your differential diagnosis list what this could be. Then step four is to formulate a diagnosis covering all aspects of the question. Then, of course, step five, which is the most important step, counter checking that your diagnosis actually matches every aspect of the condition or every aspect of the question. 
preliminaries and disclaimers. So please, the first and foremost important thing is that you have to improve your knowledge database. You cannot diagnose what you don't know. If you have never read about malaria and they present to you a case that is similar to malaria, you won't know that this is malaria. You won't be able to pick it up. So the wider you read, the more conditions you're exposed to, the better you will be at making a diagnosis of certain conditions. And this works even in real life. If you haven't seen this in real life, you probably won't be able to pick it up. So reading, 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 or rather let me just say studying conditions and having a good knowledge database goes a long way in helping you making a diagnosis. The second thing is practice, practice, practice. Pretty much exposure to questions, exposure to the thinking process. Go through many questions. This will help you now open your mind to how different conditions actually present. Actually, if you're on the wards and you're clicking a lot of patients, you can actually have a good practice on how exactly uh, conditions present. Don't be tempted to look into the file. Only look into the file after you have now exhausted your thinking capacity, you have come out with your diagnosis, and you want to compare with what the doctor that was attending to that patient was thinking initially. So practice always makes perfect. Then the third thing is make sure that you discuss your ideas with a friend or with a colleague, with a study buddy, a study partner, so that you get a different perspective. Sometimes you may be thinking in one particular way, then someone mentions something that you may have missed out in the condition or may have missed out from the history. And this actually opens your mind and opens the horizons to many different things. So please take note, and this is a disclaimer that I've put in red. You may not get it right the first time. Don't give up. It's normal. Many people get diagnosis wrong. Even I do get a lot of diagnosis wrong. But the key thing is that never make the same mistake twice. That's already obvious. If you make the mistake once, never make it twice. That's the rule of thumb in medicine. You're allowed to make certain mistakes once. There's some mistakes that you shouldn't actually even be making. But if you do make the mistakes, you're only allowed to make them once. The second time you're making the mistake, then it becomes a habit. And remember, these are people's lives that you're dealing with. So... Here's the question once again, I'll put it on the screen. I've already read through it and I hope you understand the particular question. And you may pause the video right now if you haven't read through it and then read through the question and understand the question before you continue with the video. So step one is we want to list the clinical features. So I don't want this video to be very long, so I hope it's under 15 minutes. So we want to look at our demographics. So this woman is 24 years, she's female. She's from Kawe. Those are the only demographics that, oh, she's presenting at Kawe. We're not so sure if she lives there or she was traveling there or whatever, but she's in Kawe. And we're not so sure of the other demographics. These are the only demographics. Occupation is nothing else. The symptoms that they're giving us, headache for the previous night, vomiting and feeling cold also on the previous night. The signs that were giving them that I'd been given, fever, altered mental state with a GCS of 8 out of 15, a stiff neck, rash on the legs and the abdomen, a BP of 85 over 45, and a weak pulse of 115. Remember, you should group them into symptoms and signs. Symptoms are what the patient is feeling. They are, they are having a headache. You can't actually quantify a headache. They are vomiting. Maybe you can quantify it. And they are feeling cold. You can also quantify that by measuring the temperature. Then signs are pretty much what you elicit as a doctor. So fever, altered mental status, things you can measure. So this is what these are the important aspects that are presenting to us from the question. And we've picked them out and we now have an idea of what this woman, the clinical features this woman is presenting with. So once you have done this, step one is already done. Very easy, nice and easy. We move on to step two, which is linking the clinical features to the disease. So first of all, we look at the demographics. This person is 24, 27 years old. Yeah, expecting maybe this could be an infectious process because infectious processes tend to affect many different age groups. Tumors would be unlikely in someone who's 27 year old because she's quite young. So tumors wouldn't be the first thing that you think about. The fact that she is from Kawe, maybe you're thinking maybe there are some things that are endemic there that are infectious processes, like maybe a malaria. If she was in Lusaka, the story would have been different unless if she traveled somewhere else outside Lusaka and came into Lusaka, then maybe you'd be thinking that maybe malaria, we could entertain malaria. But her being in Kawe, malaria is not a thing that you can rule out as yet. So she developed a headache the previous night. So this was rather an acute presentation. So it's it's the previous night. It's an acute presentation. This is not a chronic thing. So is there any trauma that is present? 
are there any eye problems? Because all these things can cause headaches. Is there any meningitis? This can cause a headache. Malaria, hypoglycemia, all these things can cause headaches. At this point, we do not have enough information to rule out any of these things. Of course, yes, trauma, they, they may have mentioned if there was a history of trauma. With the glasses and eye problems, they may have mentioned that in the question, of which isn't there. Meningitis, we can't rule that out. Malaria, we can't yet rule that out. And notice how malaria now has two points. Then hypoglycemia, we can't rule that out. This patient also is vomiting. You can be vomiting in malaria. Maybe this is an acute gastroenteritis because this links together with the infectious process, her being 27 years old. And could it be possible that it's a food poisoning? She starts to feel cold as well. Maybe this is a malaria. Malaria is now getting four points on the board. Maybe this is a malaria and she's feeling cold because of the malaria. Could this be a hypothermia? Was she exposed to cold? And you're thinking, these are all the conditions that you're thinking of in your mind as you're reading the question and as you teased out the important symptoms and the important signs. Then now let's get to the signs. This person has a fever. This now ties in with our infectious process. Again, malaria can cause a fever. It's mimicking so many things here. An altered mental state, a GCS of 8 out of 15, this woman is almost unconscious. So maybe could this be a trauma? Could this be hypoglycemia? Could this even be a malaria? This could be a severe malaria. So if it's a malaria, this is already gaining some steam and maybe this could be possibly a severe malaria. Okay, she also has a stiff neck. That's not a typical feature that you see in malaria. This may be in men a meningitis. Maybe she have a, has a cervical pathology that may be linked to a trauma or maybe another process. You can't also rule that out. She's having rash on the legs and the abdomen. Is this a disseminated infectious process? Because a rash, could it be petechiae? In short, could it be that there's a gram-negative infection? Is there maybe a skin disorder? We'll look at the vitals. The BP is about 85 over 45. This person is in shock. Because remember, BP less than 90 systolic, less than 60 diastolic, they're in shock. So they're in shock. What is causing the shock? Is it a septic shock because the, we have had some hints of some infectious processes that are happening in this, pro, in this person? Could it be hypovolemic shock? Could it be hemorrhagic shock? Is she bleeding? Is this maybe related to trauma? We haven't been given that information in the question. Uh, she has a weak pulse with uh, 115 beats per minute. Could this be shock? Then again, if you're thinking of septic shock, could it be that the reason why she's feeling cold and she also has a fever at the same time? Because remember, shock, you may have different stages, especially with septic shock. So keep this in mind. These are the, now the conditions that we have linked to the clinical features. And I hope you are following my discussion very well. We move to step three. So step three is now having a look at the investigations. Now, what are the possible conditions that we listed from our previous slide? So it could be severe malaria, meningitis, it could be a shock, hypovolemic, hemorrhagic or septic, it could be acute gastroenteritis, hypoglycemia, hypothermia, trauma, a cervical pathology, eye and skin pathologies, disseminated infectious process. We do an investigation, a lumbar puncture, and we realize that, okay, there's a high pressure. Maybe this is a meningitis. Maybe the headache could also be a feature of increased intracranial pressure. And we also realize that there's a gram-negative intracellular diplococcus. This is now an infectious process. So it means it makes eye pathologies unlikely because there haven't been anything of a mention like that. Skin pathologies also become unlikely because we can explain the disseminated infection that's causing the petechiae. Cervical pathologies and trauma also becomes unlikely because there was no hints of any trauma in the question or even in the investigations. They would have done investigations to rule that out. Hypothermia and hypoglycemia also become unlikely, although hypoglycemia, it could also be present in this patient. Given that it's an infectious process, this patient may be in shock. AGE becomes unlikely because there was only one thing on the history that was there. Shock, we can't rule that out yet. Meningitis, we can't. Malaria, we can't. Because they haven't yet even done an RGT. The only thing that they did and showed us in the, in the investigations was a lumbar puncture. So the conditions that we're remaining with so far, a severe malaria, meningitis, a shock, most likely septic or hypovolemic, but I'll lean more closer to septic shock, and a disseminated infectious process. That's our step three. We've now remained with four conditions, and we're narrowing things down as we go. Now, step four, now we want to now formulate our diagnosis. Let's group together all the signs and symptoms and the investigations that we had. So this was a 24-year-old woman. Kabwe, headache, vomiting, filling cold, fever, altered mental state, GCS 8 out of 15, a stiff neck, rash on the legs and the abdomen, 
a BP of 85 over 45, a weak pulse of 115 beats per minute. And they did a lumbar puncture with a high pressure and a gram-negative intracellular diplococcus. So the conditions now that may be possible. If we look at meningitis, the headache is seen in meningitis, vomiting, fever plus a stiff neck is going to be characteristic of meningitis. Altered mental state could be explaining meningitis. Even the high lumbar puncture pressure, opening pressure, is seen in meningitis. The gram-negative intracellular diplococcus is seen in meningitis, and we know that a gram-negative intracellular diplococcus, an example, is nasaria meningitis. So we're keeping this in the back of our mind. Meningitis now is becoming likely to be what this patient has. We can also rule out that this patient has a disseminated infectious process. Why? They have CNS involvement in the terms of a headache and possibly the stiff neck. They have a vomiting, which is a GIT involvement. They have a rash on the legs and the abdomen, which is pinpointing that there is some dissemination of this infection. This patient may be in septic shock. They have a, they are hypotensive. They have a tachycardia. And of course, they do have a gram-negative intracellular diplococcus, an actual focus of infection. Then it could also be a severe malaria. She's from Kawe, headache, vomiting, feeling cold, altered mental status, and she is in shock. But we haven't yet done an RDT or an MPS. That's why we would lean much more closer to the upper two diagnoses than we would lean to malaria, severe malaria. Of course, if the question was asking you for a differential, we wouldn't rule ma severe malaria out. So it means that now our diagnosis, what's going to be our diagnosis? So this person has an acute process because this happened overnight. They have a meningococcemia because it's a disseminated, intra, a disseminated infectious process. And they do have meningitis and they're in shock. So most likely septic shock. So this is the, the, our diagnosis that is linking most important things in our question. So now this is step four. We've come out now with a working diagnosis. Step five now. We now counter check that our diagnosis is linking to the question and we fill in the blanks. So this woman probably has an acute meningococcemia. I've already explained on the previous slide why. With the bacterial meningitis, we have proven that there is a bacteria and there are features of meningitis, and this woman is in septic shock. That would be my final diagnosis. Acute meningococcemia with bacterial meningitis in septic shock. Notice how every single aspect of the question is being covered by my diagnosis. Acute in the fact that it started overnight, meningococcemia in the fact that it's a gram-negative intracellular diplococcus, and meningococcemia showing you that there's some CNS involvement, there's some rash that is there in the, in the legs and the abdomen, that's the petechiae. This person is hypotensive and tachycardic. Bacterial meningitis in the fact that you have a gram-negative intracellular diplococcus and the fact that they're in shock, they're showing you features of septic shock, that's features of hypotension, and there's a focus of infection. And of course, the meningitis is with the fever, the stiff neck, the headaches, and the depressed level of consciousness. So everything in the question has been addressed. So what is a causative organism? This is a nasaria meningitis. What is the most common complication of this organism? A waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. This again goes back to my disclaimer in the preliminaries. You have to have a good knowledge database for you to be able to know this. So if you have never come across waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome or fulminant meningococcal sepsis, you wouldn't know this. So this is where there has adrenal glands uh, bilaterally, there's some hemorrhage that's happening there, adrenal gland failure, and there's vascular collapse in these patients. Patients do tend to die. Then when it comes to the management plan for the contacts, you want to isolate the contacts, uh, give them prophylactic antibiotics, rifampicin for adults and children, ciprofloxacillin only in adults. Then management plan for the communities, you want to perform some screening and diagnosis, treat those that have infections. Then we want to vaccinate the community, a MENC vaccine or a quadrivalent ACWY vaccine. Then how do we treat this patient? We pretty much want to admit them fluid and electrolyte balance, give them steroids because this is a gram-negative intracellular infection and most of these tend to have a lot of complications so steroids actually reduce the complications then the mainstay treatment is antibiotics your benzyl penicillins or an alternative is uh, ceftriaxone or cefotaxim plus or minus vancomycin if they are allergic to penicillins chloramphenicol and vancomycin again this comes down to the diagnosis which should be always the first thing that you pick out from your question if you don't know the diagnosis 
you won't be able to answer the rest of your questions because how do you investigate something that you don't know? How do you give us investigations that you don't know? I will make another segment about management and how to answer management-based questions. So if you really do want that, please comment in the section below. I will do some efforts to actually teach you on how to best answer questions of management. So what are some of the common mistakes that most people tend to make? The first and foremost thing is people don't understand the question. The examiner will never ask you the same question twice. So if you see that you're having the same question or the same answer for two different questions, there's a problem there. The second thing is that the examiner will never ask you to repeat what they've already told you. If you're repeating elements of the question in your, in your answer, then obviously you're getting it wrong. So make sure that you're not repeating what has already been told to you in the question. The second thing is that you're not considering the allocated marks. Five marks and you just write one thing. You're going to get one out of five. And then you may come out of that exam thinking that you've passed or thinking that you've answered very well, but then you have just failed because you have failed to allocate the correct uh, answers to the correct marks. Like I said, the more marks, more thinking, and a much beefier answer. Low marks or smaller marks, you don't have to think so much but make sure that you don't miss out the important things at the same time. Then the third thing is that people tend to leave out certain components of the diagnosis. And this is actually a very big thing. If you leave out a certain component of the diagnosis, you may lose some marks. The third thing, or the fourth thing rather, is ignoring investigations. They just deal and handle just with the clinical features and the, in, uh, the history and physical examination, they forget about the investigations and then they base their diagnosis based on that. You easily can get misled. Another group of individuals just focus on the investigations and leave out the clinical aspect. Again, you tend to fall into that trap. So make sure you combine all three things to come up with your diagnosis if those are given to you in the question. Then the last and the most important things is students often do not see the bigger picture. So they tend to pick out one element of the question to fit their diagnosis. For example, in that past question that I've just tackled, where someone just picks out maybe headache and a fever and they just go with malaria. They have easily disregarded the lumbar puncture and everything else that was in the question and they've missed the bigger picture. The answer is often what has the most common ground to the question. Like I told you, the bacterial meningitis and meningococcemia in the question had more common ground as opposed to severe malaria because we didn't even do an RDT for that patient or an MPS for that patient. And even when we looked at the questioning style, it was leading us towards a meningitis as opposed to a severe malaria. I really hope that made a lot of sense and that opened your mind on how to approach internal medicine questions. If you really want more of such videos, please drop a like, drop a comment, share the link of this video to a friend that's writing exams very soon. See you in the next video to Zambia and beyond. I know this was more than 15 minutes, but my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time. Bye.